this is Dr. McGinley. This lecture is continuing the content related to a fairly common complication in pregnancy, placenta previa. We do see this complication in the second trimester and beyond. Watch the Khan Academy video about placenta previa before watching this lecture. It discusses the physiology, risk factors, and precautions related to placenta previa. To reiterate some of the information from the Khan lecture, placenta previa is an abnormal implantation of the placenta. It can be a partial, marginal, or complete previa. The partial and marginal have a greater chance of moving away from the cervix as the uterus grows than the complete previa does. Look at the picture to the right so you can see the distinction between the three positions. Your textbook has a good definition related to the actual number of centimeters the placenta is away from the cervix that further characterizes the type of placenta previa. And I'll hold on a minute and not keep talking while you actually look at these different types of placenta previa. The one on the far right is the one that is the most bothersome in, because it's dangerous. Because ultrasound in pregnancy is done routinely, many of the placenta previas are diagnosed simply because we looked. But there will be some women who never have had an ultrasound and they present to us complaining of bleeding. So when you are triaging this patient either on the phone, and trust me they will be calling, not necessarily just showing up, or in the clinic or in labor and delivery, you must ask her if she is experiencing pain with the bleeding. Placenta previa has painless vaginal bleeding, which distinguishes it from another placenta disorder called abruptio placenta. You will have another lecture about this from the Khan Academy and from Professor Feruzish. Other questions that you need to ask include what was she doing before or at the time that she noticed bleeding? Some women will call in complaining of painless bleeding and all she was doing was wiping after urination. Question her further about straining to pass a stool. Was she lifting something heavy or had she had intercourse within the last 12 hours or so? You need to keep in mind that a placenta that attaches itself across the cervix is less functional than one that is implanted well into the endometrium due to the tissue structure difference between the cervix and the actual endometrium. The blood supply is quite different. When labor begins, or even when the baby drops into the pelvis, the pressure causes disruption of the placental attachment, resulting in bleeding. Sometimes this bleeding is to the extent that the patient actually hemorrhages. So stop and think, what would you expect to see on the fetal monitor if this situation happened? I'll have a question near the end of the lecture where you actually can say what you think would happen. There are a variety of nursing interventions that are very important when caring for a patient with placenta previa. Always keep this condition in mind when a patient complains of vaginal bleeding. Until we know for certain where that placenta is, do not insert anything into the vagina. That means no vaginal exams or vaginal ultrasound. This patient does need an abdominal ultrasound. And if the RN is not allowed to perform this procedure, then you have to notify the MD. Assuming the patient is not in labor, 
she will be put on bed rest to reduce the weight of the fetus on the placenta. Place her on the fetal monitor to check for distress. Monitor the patient's vital signs watching for changes indicative of blood loss. If the patient or the baby are not stable, we're going to prepare her for an emergency cesarean section. If the patient is stable and is in a situation that she can be on full bed rest with bathroom privileges at home, then she can be discharged. It is important for the nurse to provide careful instructions about activity restrictions, including pelvic rest. And that means nothing is to go into the vagina. No tampons, no intercourse. It is important to discuss nutrition. She needs high fiber and a lot of fluids to minimize constipation. Sometimes stool softeners are provided to minimize the need to bear down when having a stool because this Valsalva maneuver can initiate bleeding. The patient will return to the fetal diagnostic center twice a week for non-stress tests by, and biophysical profiles. If this patient is not in a situation that she can maintain bed rest at home, such as she has toddlers at home and no daycare, or she has a job that requires her to stay on her feet, or she's the type of woman that has to have that super clean house, she's not a candidate to go home. There's too much risk. So what we're going to do is stabilize her in labor and delivery and eventually transfer her to the antepartum unit. And the same interventions for the patient that is treated as an outpatient will be indicated for the inpatient care. In addition, for the woman who is discharged, we have to instruct her to return to the hospital if there is any further bleeding, and the bright red bleeding means it's fresh, or if she notices a decrease in fetal movement because there can be a bit of silent bleeding and it's disrupted enough to cause fetal distress. So this ends the lecture on placenta previa.